So uh, this afternoon we're talking about personal health budgets. As we know, that's um, a means of giving it, uh, people, you know, choice and control so that they can make decisions about how best to support their own um, health and well-being. And Breda's going to particularly look at the application of personal health budgets to, to mental health. Uh, Breeder, as I'm sure you know, is um, an expert in innovation in mental health within the context of the NHS and the voluntary sector. And she's got an MA in ageing and society, which sounds absolutely fascinating. And maybe that's a subject for another talk, but um, we're, we're, we'll discuss that another time. She's also a qualified architect, so my goodness me, we've got a real, real expert with us today. We're delighted that you're here. Uh, really looking forward to hearing about your exciting work. So over to you, Breda. Um, thank you, Judith. Um, I'm going to share my screen here now. I'm also quite cringing at that introduction. Um, I don't know who you were talking about there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But thank you very much. Yes, as you have said, I am... The, my, my main job is as the programme lead for our Psychological Therapies and Wellbeing Alliance here in City and Hackney. Um, but I used to be an architect in a previous life as well. So I suppose both worlds combined a little bit when it came to developing this pathway. So just very briefly, for anybody who doesn't know what a personal health budget is, basically the, the kind of fundamental idea is that it's NHS money that would have normally been used to pay for traditional commission services. But in particular instances, like here in City and Hackney, you can use that piece of funding for something else relative to a health and wellbeing need in this instance to your recovery and mental health. So what, what did we start? What was our fundamental question with regard to this whole pathway where we decided that we would make personal health budgets accessible on the recovery pathway for people on, in mental health services? And the basic question is, what can help me get well and stay well? And that underpins the whole pathway that we designed. So as you can see here, this is a comment from our commissioner. And I have to say straight off that we are very lucky here in City and Hackney. We've been incredibly supportive um, commissioning team. Um, Dan Birmingham is our lead. Um, and one of the quotes that he has here is, personal health budgets are not intended to replace services, but instead they're the salt and pepper seasoning on top of everything else. And I just think that's a really important thing to bear in mind. There's a huge kind of national discussion about an either or choice with personal health budgets but in most areas of individual um, needs and care and particularly in mental health everybody is different and everybody has their own kind of um, ways of recovering so it's not about making somebody choose one thing or another it's about understanding that a personal health budget can expand out the range of options that are available to somebody to help them to get well and stay well um, through using a personal health budget. So what did we do here in Hackney? So what we did is we looked at the recovery pathway. So um, just there's a couple of clinical kind of things just to clarify. So the first is this pathway is for people who have what we call a severe and enduring mental health illness. So that's somebody who what we say is open to secondary mental health services. So that's people who have kind of ongoing kind of a mental health condition such as um, bipolar, schizophrenia, um, personality disorder. Um, things in the clinical world would be called a cluster four or higher. So it's people who have long-term mental health needs um, due to the condition that they have. So the service, the clinical provider for, the, for the, our treatment and recovery services is ELFT, which is East London Foundation Trust. So we worked very hard with East London Foundation Trust and Jane Kelly is also on this call, who's the recovery lead, who I promised I wouldn't pick on, but she is here and she was, in, she was the absolute um, foundation of us being able to do this, where she helped us to embed the, the role of personal health budgets in the recovery pathway that um, ELF are already doing because um, a recovery doesn't start with the personal health budget. The recovery conversation starts at the very beginning when you talk to that person about what matters to you, what would help you to get well and stay well. And then from that, a personal health budget can be one of the options, but obviously there are other things as well. So it's all about understanding what matters to the person. So as you can see on this pathway, there's a process where you have that recovery conversation focus conversation with the person and in ELF they use um, a tool called Dialogue Plus which helps somebody to identify what's important to them, what they'd like to improve upon and then the next step is to understand how. 
So the next, as you go through the pathway, then it moves from identifying um, what your recovery goals would be to then looking at support planning, figuring out what actually you might be able to do to, um, to achieve your recovery goals. Then looking at the budget cal calculation, which is how much money, if you are going to use a PHB, would you need? And then how you would access that. And then there's a, a process around signing it up, setting up the payments and reviewing and closing. So just very briefly to explain how we manage the funding model here, because traditionally personal health budgets came from continuing healthcare, where somebody would be given a certain number of hours depending on their health needs. So what the, the transition there was that you could have the same value of money of those hours. Um, and it was very clear cut because it was crossing from one from a care need, which was quite straightforward. However, when we were doing our design workshops here in City and Hackney, and when we were trying to understand an indicative budget, which is the term NHS England use, where we'd identify the amount of money that the person could have before we looked at what the recovery goal was and what their support needs were, it really didn't fit well. And it felt like we were putting a value on a person before we even had a, a conversation with them about what was important to them and what they might need to get well and stay well. So we flipped it around and we set the support planning first of all, so we identify the recovery goals and then depending on what value of a personal health budget there is, there's a different level of sign off with that. So our personal health budgets, they're a one off payment, they can be used of over a period of 12 months. So for things like a gym membership or something like that. And the value is so anything between 10 pounds and 250 pounds, the clinician just can sign that off themselves, it'll be sent to the advocacy project, who are the, the kind of central cog and all of this in, in, in setting up all the payments and processing and everything. If it's between 250 pounds or 750 pounds, the, the clinician manager has to co-sign it to say yes this is a really good idea I agree that this will help this person to get well and stay well and then if it's over 750 pounds it goes for what we call e-approval and on our e-approval panel we have a commissioner from the mental health um, commissioning service within the CCG we have the PHB lead for city and hackney in East London Foundation Trust who is a lady called Kath and then we have um, somebody from the service user involvement panel one of our experts by experience and the three of them review it and if there's any if they're not able to come to consensus it goes to um jane kelly who is here as as the overall trust recovery lead. but we've we've not gotten to that point yet so jane has had a, a relatively quiet time of it in year one but she's there to guide us and to support us that we're always keeping the recovery priorities of the individual at the center and and, and staying true to that so that's the pathway and that's how it works in hackney so one of the big tools that we developed um was a uh, a specific support plan which is this document here it looks a bit mess messy on the slide but the idea is, is that it's two sides of an A4 and it folds up so it can fit in somebody's pocket and again this was co-designed with our service user involvement group we had a number we had one from um, the advocacy project we had one from core arts and we also had um, a group from Elft who all helped us to develop this and the idea is, is that this is owned by the person. There's different sections that they can choose to fill out about what their preferences are, how they want to be supported. And um, there's also an area for consent, which you'll see in the bottom left, which is important because obviously everything has to happen with the consent of the person. And then it also sets out obviously what the recovery goals are, what the payments are, and an action plan with that. Um, and this then, the, the whole purpose of this is that a copy is given to the person and a copy is so, sent to the advocacy project. And that really means that this is co-developed by the by the person, the budget holder, and whoever it is supporting them, be it their clinician in Elft, or now we also have people in core arts that are doing that. And this was co-designed, um, as I said, with us and with our service user involvement group. So we're a year down the road. So our first year, the goal was that we were to have at least between 150 and 180 um, personal health budgets and mental health. Um, and when, when we get everybody to submit them, we ask everybody to tick what their recovery goal is. And as I said earlier, ELF use um, a program called Dialogue Plus. So we use the same categories to define recovery goals with Dialogue Plus so that you can see. So obviously the single biggest recovery goal that everybody has is for their mental health, um, which would make sense they're all um, in treatment for, for that at the moment. But then as you can see, there's a huge range down along. Um, leisure activities, physical health, um, and I think the physical health one is going to be interesting, especially with um, the questions that we had earlier about the new obesity movement and things like that, and um, about helping people to manage their physical health in a way that they want to. And we've seen that a lot actually with a lot of the budgets that people are using them for to go to a gym that's close to them that they like to go to or to access particular classes like Zumba or yoga um, and things that wouldn't necessarily be in the 
traditional commission services or to buy um, equipment and a, like an exercise bike. And I think somebody was looking at a treadmill at the beginning of lockdown, but I'm not sure if they actually went ahead with that. Um, but things that can help them to manage their physical health independently. Um, and then we obviously we've um, expressions of identity. For anybody who doesn't know City and Hackney, and I'm sorry, I probably should have started by explaining the borough. Um, it's an inner city borough in London. Um, I have only ever lived and worked in Hackney, so I think it's the best borough in London. Um, but it also has a huge multicultural um, population. I think there's over 300 registered languages in the borough, and there's quite large um, BAME communities in the borough. So obviously there's a lot on uh, and we, we get a lot of um, feedback from budget holders around using their personal health budget to help them to kind of come with their kind of you know, their cultural identity and things like that. And then obviously job situations. We're a very young borough and the majority of, of our adults are under 45. So employment um, is always an issue. And what we've seen is people using their personal health budget to do some um, further education learning or for some training so that they can go back to work. Um, so there's a, a really nice range of recovery goals there, which you can see from the group. So yeah, so in our first year, our target goal was to have between 150 and two and 180 um, personal health budgets, um, we will say requested by people in services. So by the by the end of the first year, we had 216, which was great. We were delighted with that. Um, and we did see quite a spike um, during COVID, which I'll talk about in a little bit. I'm not sure if I put a slide in, but I will talk about how we adapted this for COVID um, in a few minutes, because again, that links with um, questions that were asked earlier. So here are just some examples of how the personal health budget has been used. And um, um, I'm not going to read them all out, but I think I suppose just to, to pick out um, some um, you know, you can see that there's further education ones like the French course and a certificate in housing practice. Um, there's some very simple ones like a table tennis bat so that somebody can join a table tennis club. Um, some seat clothing, which is to help people to somebody to understand their identity and feel connected to their culture. So there's a huge range. Um, and I think it's to the credit of the clinicians and ELF and to the budget holders themselves that everybody really embraced the whole idea of personal health budgets and really using them really, really kind of innovatively and being not being afraid to think about the individual you know and, and not thinking oh like has this been done before but being really open-minded about it and we've, we've had such a lovely range of different things so i have a couple of, ex of more detailed examples that show how the budget has helped somebody in the next few slides so for example with this sarah was an artist who wanted to learn a new skill um, her recovery goals were that she was hoping to meet new friends and prevent a relapse um, and her budget was for £560, it's her bronze casting course. So in the greater scheme of everything, not a huge amount of money. But since completing the course, she's met new friends. She's actually rented a studio space where she did her course and continued her work. And she's also been able to, med to reduce her medication. And in her own words, she said, this has given me my life back. I feel like my myself again and I'm full of hope for my future. So that's quite a powerful example of how you know just looking and talking to what about with Sarah and understanding what her priorities were finding something or supporting her to find I think she was fairly clear in the course that she wanted and um, she knew about it and was quite keen to have it and supporting her to have it and for the clinician to recognize that this was not necessarily um, you know kind of a casual hobby but something that would help her to build all those new life skills learning friends securing the studio space and now she's able to continue her her artwork which obviously is is somewhere that is an outlet for her as well to to kind of express herself and then we have another one which was Henry who wanted to start who had started doing his GCSEs which was part of his recovery goal and he was very um, it was obviously very important to him to get a qualifications um, but he doesn't like leaving the house so he finds it hard to use the computers in the library so he got a laptop which was £329 and then from that his impact scores have improved by 20% which is really impressive and as you can see um, <laughs> while he got his laptop to um, do studying, he's um, using it now to launch his own business. So um, it, it's amazing when, when people are given opportunity, what everybody will, will do with it. So that's, that's just another story. And then this last example for now is um, Yoland, who um, found that making clothes helped her to feel good. So her recovery goal was to develop new skills in African clothes making so that she could start selling in a market and her own business. So she had, um, there was a course that was found in the New City College for um, a clothes making course specifically for African clothes, which cost £140. 
and now she's continuing to work towards her goal. She's doing researching and experimenting. So as she says, the course that she did gave her new skills, which helped her with the sewing and with the therapeutic aspect. And she got her involved in a group and gave her a bit of routine, which was also nice. So as you can see again, quite small amounts of money, but really significant outcomes in how they are impacting on that person and helping them to, as we said at the very beginning, how to get well and stay well. Um, so what, one of the things that we found really interesting was, you know, obviously our priority are our budget holders and making sure that a personal health budget has a positive impact on them as, as the practitioners or as the budget holders and as the people who, who are recovering. But actually what was, has been even more exciting, well not more exciting, but equally as exciting is the impact that having access to personal health budgets and recovery has had for the mental health practitioners, for our care coordinators. Um, they have been felt really liberated and we've gotten really positive feedback from staff saying that, you know, knowing that there's access to a personal health budget has really empowered them within their role. Whereas before when they'd asked somebody what would their recovery goals be, they'd have to caveat with that, you know, they only had were able to access with say the commission services of whatever was free within the voluntary sector. Whereas now, um, because they can talk about a personal health budget, it's really opened up conversations with um, the clinicians themselves. So you can see there's two quotes here. Um, we had an evaluation piece completed with them um, in DTI and NHS England. Um, and you know, one, one care coordinator said, people who haven't been interested in anything for years are thinking for themselves. You know, I think it's more people who weren't interested in what was being commissioned and offered to them are now, you know, being empowered to think more widely with a personal health budget. But it's that, you know, yeah, it's, it's impossible to preemptively cater for everybody and it's much more practical to ask people what's important for them. And then the other care coordinator, I've got people in college after being out of work for 20 years. So that's pretty amazing as well to see that. And we're really seeing that with um with um the clinicians as well within ELFT and Core Arts, which is our other provider, that they're really starting to kind of be really proactive about talking to people and you know helping them to kind of really open up their own minds because it's a hard question to think about um cold you know what are your recovery goals or what would help you to get well and stay well you know it, it, it's a it's a it's a question that i think needs time from an individual person person's perspective to kind of build up to and that's why within our pathway we have um phb advisors who are based in the advocacy project and part of their role as well as doing all of the kind of practical setting up of the phb is to support um a budget holder to um that might want to think about things a bit more because if you've not really thought about this in a long time and you've just been used to being offered what's commissioned in a you know what's been commissioned it, it, you do need a little bit of support and time to to think about what what matters to you and what what would help you to get well and stay well and also maybe to believe that it is possible to get that from a personal health budget because you know sometimes um the system isn't always necessarily going to be able to give everything you know people might have had bad experiences in the past and things like that which can kind of help feel that they, they may not want to kind of engage in this in the beginning. So it's been it's been a, an amazing partnership. We've been very lucky that between having um, East End London Foundation Trust as our mental health provider and the advocacy project as our kind of brokerage service and kind of core infrastructure for all that we've really been able to achieve quite a lot in our first year, which we are all very, very proud of. Um, and that's the end, but I'm going to end with this quote, who's the Elf Recovery Lead, who obviously it's um, anonymous, but Jane, you may recognise these words, um, which again is just a really powerful line that we always come back to on our project. And when I'm talking with other sites and maybe with people who might focus a bit more on the money than the, the actual activity in these side of things that it's not about the purchase it's not about the value it's about the recovery you're going to achieve and as long as you keep the focus on that it's amazing what you can achieve but actually quite small amounts of money and quite simple purchases as i hope i've shown you in some of our examples um, but i leave it at that now if that's okay judith and maybe if there's any questions that people might have yeah, that, that's super, Breda. Thank you. Um, do, do you want to just talk about the COVID fast track offer, oh, bearing in mind Carol's questions from earlier? Yeah, yeah, excuse me. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I like that here in City and Hackney when lockdown happened, um, a certain amount of things moved into place quite quickly. Um, and like that practical needs such as food and medication and things were coordinated by our, our local authority, by the council services, and they set up a humanitarian hub 
pretty much almost overnight, which was amazing. But one of the things that was missing and one of the things obviously that we were most concerned about is all of our people who would normally have been accessing clinical support support therapy and things like that for their mental health and well-being that all closed down almost overnight so we were very worried that people might you know you don't you don't stop having a mental health condition just because we're in a lockdown so we were very worried that this would have a, an additional negative impact on people and particularly that people may feel isolated and that they would have nobody to talk to so what we were able to do with this pathway is create what we called a COVID-19 stay connected PHB offer where we had Identity, and I have to give all the credit to Bonnie from the Advocacy Project because she did all the work on this, where we um, identified three different um, smartphones all around £100 plus a SIM um, which was about £10 a month which had data on it and if somebody needed a smart, wanted a smartphone then they would, through their care coordinator, send a message in saying I want a, a smartphone and a SIM, or I want a non-smartphone and a SIM, or I just want a SIM, I already have the device, but I don't have the data, and talk with the clinician about how they were going to use it to help them to stay connected and stay well during lockdown. Um, and then they then it would be sent to, to the advocacy project to Bonnie, and she then, there was three different options. It would either be sent directly to the person if they felt confident enough to set up the phone themselves, or they, it would be sent to their clinician or their care coordinator who would then set it up and take it to them using um, um, the appropriate PPE. Or the third option was that the phone and the SIM would be sent to Bonnie who would then set it up, put down whatever apps were requested and then get a courier to the individual. Um, so we, we we, we've provided over a hundred um, devices and SIMs with that offer. Um, and it's something that we're going to continue to have as an offer beyond lockdown because it's something you know I, again the other thing that um that COVID has shown is that there's a huge digital divide between people who have access to the internet and people that don't um, and that's something that I think is going to be part of a national conversation as we move forward um, but for us it's as a local um offer we're going to make sure that we have it and we had some lovely examples as well of people like that being able to stay in touch with um friends and family um people being able to just feel safe stay connected and just as well with um you know during covid um as they as people who would have been homeless were all um, housed temporarily in hotels and things so we were also able to work with people who would have been homeless in city and hackney and offer them smartphones um so that they then were able to access um support around kind of um benefits and obviously physical and mental health services so it's been much more than just about you know chatting with friends people are using it very very practically as well um, and we've gotten really lovely feedback from everybody um, so yes yeah, so we're really really pleased with that um, and one of the one of the th extra things we did is as well as offering it to everybody who is open to health um, services was that we looked uh, in the GPs and we asked the GPs for everybody they so they have a register for anybody who has a diagnosis of what we call an SMI um, a severe during mental illness and we got we arranged um, for five and a half thousand letters to be sent out to everybody on the register in Hackney inviting them to ring up if they would if they felt a smartphone would be helpful um, to them to help them to um, manage during lockdown um, so that was great that we were able to kind of offer quite a solid and practical support to people during COVID, which was like very much focused on helping people to manage their, their mental health and well-being during lockdown, particularly around social isolation and things like that. So yeah, so thank you for reminding me. Sorry, yeah. I forgot. Super, thank you. That was a really good answer to Carol's questions earlier. So thank you for that. Do you want to take your screen off share and then we can see your face in the middle? So that would be great. Um, and uh, some questions um, coming in now. So, um, is e approval the same as commission, commissioner group approval, commission group approval in the NHS? Yes. Yeah, so we. So this is our local. Um, how we've set it up locally. So different areas will have different. They'll have their own local way of, of managing things. So what 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 it. What I would compare most is the language we might understand most is um, panel when things would have to go to panel before and where you'd have a, a group of people physically sitting there and once a week they'd meet and they'd look at things and decide yes no or whatever but what we wanted because again we're talking relatively small amounts of money because typically um, 
personal budgets and social care are for thousands and sometimes tens of thousands of pounds worth of value. This is hundreds. Um, so we wanted something that was very, very fast. So that's why we set it up as an e-approval. But there is one of our commissioners from the CCG is one of the three on the e-approval. Um, it, it's usually Fawzi or Dan. So um, they, they still represent the CCG on that, in that instance. Yeah, got you. Thank you. Uh, the next question. Um, so I'll read out the next question. But but uh, everyone, please, if you do have questions, just pop it on the, the chat function. So the next one, um, is it just a one off payment for one thing? What if the person's progress means that something else is needed? And is there a limit? That's a really good question. Um, and I'm thank you for asking it because that, that's something that I wasn't very clear on. So it's for the recovery goal that's most important to that person at that point. So for example, if we look at um, Yolanda's story where she was did the sewing course to um, set up her, learn her, the skills about her clothing, she could have a next recovery goal, which would be like, I would like to set up my own market stall. So I'd like to do a business development course. So that would be her next person, her next recovery goal. And as long as she's still within East London, within secondary mental health services, she can have another personal health budget then to achieve this new recovery goal. Um, there's no limit as long as it's for a specific recovery goal. Um, and there's no upper limit with regard to value, but obviously the more expensive something is, just there would be a higher level of scrutiny around how this is the only thing that will help that person to achieve their recovery goal and nothing else. Because we do have a lot of conversations with budget holders and with the people that refer in about like, what, and I think a good example um, is a lot of people, about maybe six or more, have asked for an Apple Mac um, laptop rather than, you know, a, your run-of-the-mill laptop. But when we've drilled down into each of those, and an Apple Mac costs more than a thousand pounds, they're quite expensive compared to, if you saw the example of the laptop here was 300 pounds. But when we've drilled down, there's been a really valid reason why it had to be a MacBook and not anything else. For example, one person, he um, wanted to start DJing and he has was learning how to DJ through core arts, um, but then wanted a MacBook because all of the setups in any of the places that he would go to DJ, they're all set up for a MacBook. So he couldn't have a normal laptop. So when we drill down to it, then we understand it like that. So it's more about, again, that conversation with the person that starts at the kind of their, their I miss was their, their support planning and identifying from that on and that down. So, yeah, I hope that answered all the bits of that question, did it? Yeah, no, no, it did. It was great. Thank you. Um, a couple more on eligibility. Um, is it across all boroughs? Is it available, you know, nationally? What's the criteria? Um, so, so more on eligibility. And then there's another question about how does this fit with continuing healthcare assessments? And is there now a separate process for this? Okay, so I'll start with eligibility. So for this specific pathway, we're only, we're based in City and Hackney. So if you are an adult living in city or Hackney, if you're over 18, if you have a diagnosis of a, what we call a severe and enduring mental health illness, um, and if you are currently receiving either treatment or recovery focused support from East London Foundation Trust, i.e. you have a named clinician, mm -hmm. then you can consider a personal health budget for your recovery. Um, on an, different boroughs have different approaches. Um, on a national level, um, and this is a little bit technical, but bear with me. The only there's only a, a legal foundation for a right to have a personal health budget under continuing health care and for people who are on a section 117 aftercare. So section 117, for anybody who doesn't know, it's community based aftercare after someone has been in hospital um, for uh, basically has been sectioned under the Mental Health Act. I think there's a couple of other kind of things around it as well but I'm section 117 is an area that I'm a little bit grey on myself um, but if you are on a section 117 um, or if you have continued healthcare needs you have a right to have but the right you you have a, a right to have a PHB but you only have the right to have the assessment to have the PHB the actual PHB itself still has to be agreed by you and whoever is involved in your clinical care so the right to have is the right to have an assessment and um, outside of that personal health budgets are being used in loads of different ways in loads of different areas. Some people are using them with young people, some people are using them with um, dementia care, some people are using them with um, 
people who've had babies I'm, I'm not very good at the baby things I can't remember what that word is what's that it's not maternity cares whatever you know different different areas depending on what the, the local need is but what's different with that local need is if you, let's just say for example someone who ha wants is having a baby in Hackney said I'd, I would like a PHB the CCG can just say no and they don't have to give any reason because she that person has no right to have a personal health budget under the legislation whereas someone on a section 117 contacted the CCG and said, I'd like, I want a PHB for X, Y, or Z. The CCG, well, in our instance, would be able to say, yeah, just go <laughs> speak to the advocacy project and, and your, your, whoever your clinician is with ELFT. Um, but in another area, if they didn't have a pathway set up, that CCG would have to explain to the person that um, what they're asking for might not be possible, or they might have to look at it on an individual basis and see how they could help. So there is fluctuation kind of on the national model. So what we have is specific for City and Hackney. Yeah. Yeah, got you. Thank you. So I think that addresses a number of the questions that people are asking about Section 117. Um, there's a question here um, about how would you get the ball rolling to, to kind of kick off um, the process in whichever borough, whichever area that you live in, what, whatever that local offer is, how would people do that? So I think if you're if you're a professional as and if you're a commissioner, um, you speak with your whoever your secondary mental health provider is. When we when we wanted to get the ball rolling here, we had a scoping meeting where we got NHS England's personalisation team to come down with us, and we had then our commissioners from the local authority, the CCG. We had some of the clinical leads from ELFT. We had some of our lead voluntary sector providers, um, and we we had everybody around the table. We had the our some of our um people participation is at the table but at that point we didn't have any experts by experience at the table simply because we didn't want to do any unrealistic raising of hopes if that scoping medium was going to knock it out of the park we didn't want to kind of frustrate anybody but once kind of any the people who have the money um, were on board as in our commissioners um, the next step then was to have that same meeting with some of our representatives across our different service user groups and agree how we would then design it and move it forward um, and then everything from that then was designed in partnership and co-produced across ELFT, um, our experts by experience, um, our voluntary sector providers and then obviously I was involved as the, the alliance lead to kind of pull it all together and get it all done. Um, I think if anybody is stuck and on a professional side of things, um, NHS England do um, give a lot of support. They have um, PHB mentors, I'm one of them, where we can come and help um, on, on like what we do one-to-one -one mentoring on size. Um, but the first thing like that would be to kind of, I think f when, when we were looking at it in sitting Hackney, it's about having your reason why you think it's a good idea ready. And in City and Hackney, we have quite high um, precedence of bipolar and um, other kind of um, severe and injury mental health illnesses in the borough, kind of disproportionately to the nat national level. And we were having seen instances where lots of people were what we call getting stuck on the pathway that they were able to get so far, but then they weren't able to kind of get over their line of recovery because there just wasn't the services there to meet their needs. And what was happening then was people were getting so far, then kind of just discharging or just being held in services but not actually advancing and we were quite concerned that this was not the best that it could be and that was her and we were like well actually could personal health budgets be um an option or a um, kind of a solution to that here for us so that we're actually able to offer a much wider kind of support and recovery service for people and so far so good the first year has shown us that yes we were we were on on the right um track with that idea and now obviously we'll, we'll grow on that over the next the next few years hopefully Great, thank you. Some really uh, useful tips there. Uh, really um, interesting question. The next one, uh, we know that hard to reach communities miss out on opportunities like this or can miss out on opportunities like this. How is, um, how is this being addressed regarding the BAME communities in, in Hackney? So how are you making sure um, equal access across all all communities. 
that's a really good question. Thank you. And one that obviously we're very concerned about because we have such a diverse borough here in Hackney. So one of the most practical things that we're, we're working on doing now is we're going to translate most of the tools and the documents that we have into a number of different languages. Bonnie and I are trying to pull together kind of a list of what are the most commonly spoken ones. Um, another thing that we do is, so I, I this work stream sits within our Psychological Therapies and Wellbeing Alliance. So that's a partnership across seven or eight different organizations. But within that, we have um, three um, which are BAME specific um, mental health providers. So Derman is a provider who works with the Turkish and community, community and Bikr Hollam work with our Haredi Jewish community. And City and Hackney Mind have a sub-service called Irie Mind, which is specifically for the African and Caribbean heritage community. Um, what we're also looking to do this year is do some partnership working with our Vietnamese community as well in the borough um, and the, the first step with that would be making sure that we have uh, as a minimum the, the kind of information and things translated um, and what we're hoping to do in the second year another thing that we want to do is make sure that actually everybody who has has the potential to access a PHP is aware of it and because obviously there's criteria we can't just kind of put something on the side of a bus like you kind of can for other services because while it's free at the point of entry you have to have certain um, kind of um, criteria to be able to access it so we're going to design like a little postcard with um, our service user involvement group um, with um, within the advocacy project that will sit within elf services so if somebody's in the waiting room they can pick this up and they can go oh i want to learn more and then potentially either contact the advocacy project or bring it into um, a support session with their clinician and say oh i saw this in the in the waiting room can you tell me more about it so that we're empowering every individual as much as well um, so yeah so that that's we're very conscious of that and then obviously the other thing will be as we move forward with our case studies and examples making sure that we have as diverse a kind of an example and making sure that we pull cases that will connect with other people where people are like oh I, I recognize that so you know examples from mothers and, and from you know there was the the one about the clothing and things like that so that we're very much kind of reflecting I think what people in the borough would maybe see and think oh actually that's something I would like to do as well. Mm. Yes yeah it makes sense right so uh, a practical question here um, are the risks of somebody having a smartphone having it taken from them are risk assessments in place? What, what kind of practical steps are taken in relation to that? Yeah, absolutely. So everybody who, with, with every personal health budget, people talk about the risk that might be associated with, but more importantly than the risk, how that risk can be managed and can be mitigated. So one of the things, again, that we are developing, because the smartphone offer has only been up and running for maybe 10 weeks at this stage since lockdown, it wasn't since lockdown began because it took a couple of weeks to get it up and running. Um, but one of the things that we are working with our with the um, our services involvement group is um, a stay safe kind of sheet or kind of guidance so that when people have a smartphone, they can understand, you know, not having it out on the street and just the, the kind of common sense things that you tell yourself um, and just making sure that that's there. And we just wanted to check in with our service user group, first of all, to be like, is this a bit patronizing to be producing something like this or actually do you think this would be useful? And they were like, no, no, that we think this is a, this is really useful. But with everything, you know, the discussion on risk is, is so important because there's risk in everything we all do, um, but that doesn't mean you don't do it. Um, it just means you need to like be mindful so that you kind of manage and mitigate the risk. And it's the same in these instances that with any personal health budget, it's not just about the risk, but it's about how you're going to manage that risk so it doesn't become an issue. Um, and I know when we were up to about 70 something smartphones of that, um, we'd had four that were reported lost or stolen. So one was lost two were stolen and one was broken so you know that's not I mean like as someone who breaks a phone at least once every six months I couldn't really say anything about the broken ones and you know that's life too but there's a learning from that and, and for all of those people they we have another template about if somebody wants to reapply for another smartphone just explain what happened how they're going to make sure or man, try not to let that happen again and what the smartphone was helping them with so that you know we're always bringing it back to that recovery goal because accidents happen to everybody and that doesn't mean you shouldn't have a second chance so yes yeah, so that's how we manage it here got you thanks next question about capacity and unwise choices so do you have any cases where um, capacity, people trying to do things that were unwise became uh, a difficult issue 
and um, separate part of this question, do you see the scope for this kind of approach being um, extended to physical health? Okay, um, so with regard to the capacity and unwise, there have been some personal health budgets that have been sent through to the advocacy project that when Bonnie or the team have reviewed them, they've looked at them and said, this doesn't feel like it's actually achieving a recovery goal or, you know, actually, is this, is this what the person thinks? And that has been pushed back to the clinician and budget holder to, you know, draw out and to tease out in that instance. Um, so I think where things have been unwise is where sometimes um, the person has maybe wanted something that isn't really a recovery related goal, but the clinician maybe has felt like it's better to have the, the advocacy project as, as the, the, the bearer of the bad news rather than having that discussion with them before putting it through. Um, and an, an early example of that was where somebody and um, the, the budget holder wanted to do, I think maybe two different learning courses and a gym membership and some other thing all at once to a value of £4,000. And while the value wasn't like you know if, if it was if it was possible that was fine but what was more concerning was like this is somebody who you know was coming out of recovery and to do any one of those four things as a starting point was going to be quite an, an undertaking so to do all four at once and we felt just wasn't really I mean it wouldn't really be achievable for anybody and um, so you know in that instance we, we took that back to the clinician and to the budget holder and um, but you know the clinician is the person who has that conversation with the person and just you know it's their responsibility to make sure that um, that, that, that what, what the person is asking for is, is in that sense safe and is, is relevant and appropriate for the recovery goal. Um, with regard to physical health needs, yeah, I mean, like, I don't know what our intention, well, what the commissioner's intention will be in Hackney, but I definitely think that this is, you know, I think personal health budgets have such potential and opportunity. And I think for so long, there's been kind of a wariness about them because, you know, often the, the message is that it's like, it's a, like that it's a need there or that if, if we use personal health budgets here, the traditional commission services, they have to cut their budgets um, and that's a really negative and I think a really unfair kind of narrative that has been put out because actually what we're seeing is that by having this personal health budgets here in addition to our commission services where we're hopefully going to save money is in our acute services mm -hmm. people won't hopefully be going into crisis won't have to get to the point of being so unwell that they have to be readmitted to hospital and start their recovery journey all over again so that's where you know if you if you think about the kind of the whole pathway and the whole health economy just because you don't see the saving in the specific area that you're working it's not that there's not a saving in a different area um, and I, I'm also kind of reluctant to put it back to just money because I think that misses the whole point of everything that it's not like I think if you start at this as a cost saving exercise you're never going to achieve what you could because that's and that's why as I said our our, our underpin is always what can get help me to get well and stay well not what can shave 50 pounds off something here or there you know because I think that's that's completely the wrong view to have with it but it, so for all of that um physical health I can see personal health budgets being really um you know could be an opportunity and again um Rose's question at the beginning around the obesity um agenda that the government is bringing in um I mean I, we'll have to wait till we hear the details of that but there could be potential like that um no sorry it was Carl not Rose excuse me Carl um if if um if the you know if the government is serious about helping people to manage their physical health and i'd say manage your physical health rather than just lose weight because i think there's more to it than that but a personal health budget could be an opportunity you know one of the things that i think another one that we didn't have an example here for was that somebody wanted to start eating more healthily so they bought a nutri bullet with their personal health budget so they could make smoothies so you know it's not just about going to the gym or buying a wayne scales or things like that it's much more about thinking about what your lifestyle choices are where you want to go with those and potentially then how a personal health budget can help in those instances. Mm, interesting. Uh, next one, uh, how are you supporting people with learning disabilities who also have mental health needs through this approach? Well, at the minute, if somebody has a learning disability but is open to health services and receiving treatment for their mental health condition, then the personal health budget is around the recovery goal. We do have um, a number of people in the service who would have what we call a dual diagnosis. Um, but um, as long as the what they're managing the recovery goal around is so, an area where they're 
deemed to have capacity, which I know is a, an ugly term, but as long as that person is open to it. And, and we did have some of, sm of the smartphone um, requests were definitely for, um, were for the, were, were with people that were in what we'd call our supported living um, projects mm -hmm. and, and things like that. So there's, we're, we, you wouldn't, having a dual diagnosis of a learning disability and a mental health condition would not exclude you from this pathway. But equally, um, you, your recovery goal would need to be related to your mental health recovery. Um, and once that's the case, then um, the, the person would have a clinician that would be able to support them in the practical side of things. And there is an easy read version around personal health budgets that we've gotten from NHS England that obviously we use as part of our resources. And that would be another thing that we will be translating across. So for anybody who wanted kind of to learn more about it in that instance. So um, I hope that answers the question. I suppose we're very lucky here that it's fairly wide. So we've not had to kind of pigeonhole people. So yeah, so that's how we're working with it. Yeah. And um, back to the uh, cost benefit analysis. Next question, um, you know, is going back, you know, quite understand what you, what you said is, you know, it needs to be looked at as a means to recovery and a tool for recovery. It's not just about shaving off budgets, but budgets are, you know, yeah. of course, uh, an increasing issue at the moment. So it's a question here, is there an evidence base or cost benefit analysis that establishes the effectiveness of personal health budgets over the, the long term and um, saves money at the acute end? Yeah, so well there's there's it's we're only in the first year so it's hard to kind of show a kind of a long-term cost but we are very intent on wanting to capture that so what we're what we're able to show in year one is that the average cost of a direct payment comes in at just under 400 pounds and if we compare that to what the cost of what we would call um the commissioned provision or the commissioned option that um has a unit cost of 600 pounds so already we're able to show that actually the people's the average cost of a direct payment personal health budget is less than what the commission service is and obviously it gives us a much wider range to offer people what we're hoping to do in year two and the reason i say hoping is because whenever you're trying to link data sets you have to have a lot of patience and a lot of optimism but um i, I it will happen it just will take time and what we're hoping to do is um nhs england have a central database where all of the different um reports get pulled in and so you know most people think Every, the NHS is all connected. It's not. Everything sits in its own little, um, its own little data set or its own little data folder. So what we are going to do, um, with support obviously from the tech team, is they're going to use, um, the the budget holders their NHS number because that's an anonymous unique identifier, mm -hmm. and run that against the acute records in City and Hackney for the same NHS numbers, and also look at. Um, access to GPs and appointments in GPs and what we'll do over the next two years anyway is look at the number of times people had to go to hospital or had to go to A&E and then we'll use that period of time with the personal health budget as kind of the line in the sand and then look that afterwards that did those people need to go to A&E as much or are they you know or did they go to their GP as much and if we'll be able to show that actually somebody after a personal health budget didn't have to go back into hospital in those two years. So then we can kind of draw a conclusion that in that instance, the personal health budget could have had a role to, to help that person to not get back into hospital. So that's that's the wider piece of work that we're going to be doing on that. Um, it's, it's hard to do that wider evidencing, but it's critical. So that's why we're really going to stick with it in that instance and see how we can get on. So yeah, so that's that's where we're at with that. What an interesting piece of work. In, mm. Interesting is one word. <laughs> Very difficult to do is another. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, next question. How are um, carers or families involved in the application process? As much as the individual wants them to be, um, it, it, that, that, is the, that decision is for the budget holder to make. Mm -hmm. And then as much as they want to be is fine. Yeah, got you. Um, can you use a personal health budget to pay for private counselling? Again, a really good question. Um, there's different, let me see, there's no clear direction from NHS England on this. So everybody sets up their own local arrangements. And here in Hackney, our arrangement is, you can use a personal health budget to access a therapy 
the if it is not already available within the commission services. So what you can choose a personal health budget is to almost like skip a waiting list. So if it's a therapy that that is already available within our commission services, no, you can't. But if it's a therapy that you spoke with your clinician and you both agree that actually what you what's best and remember this isn't something that you as an individual are able to just decide for yourself it has to be in a dialogue with your clinician and if you and your clinician both agree that yeah the therapy that you need is this therapy and i'm not a clinician so i'm not going to be able to give clinical examples i'm sorry um is this then your clinician would work with you to find um a private um provider of that therapy they would verify that this person has the right qualifications and it is the right therapy and then they would help you with your PHB request for that therapy because then your clinician will still check in with you as you're having that therapy to make sure that it is doing as you hoped and it's helping you with your recovery because you would still be under that responsibility of the clinician. Okay thank you. Um, the next one, if someone needs assistance with communication with the doctor, for example, they're an adult with selective mutism, is there uh, a funding package to, to help that engagement? Um, I, I, that's a difficult case, I suppose, but I could give it as a, as a scenario that if somebody like that was completing a period of treatment for a, a mental health um, need but like that had selective mutism and one of their recovery goals would be to be able to go to the GP and how they would manage that. Yeah. Um, a personal health budget can't be used for ongoing care and support it has to be for a recovery focused goal so what it may be would be that um, the PHB would be used to like to kind of purchase maybe some sort of a communication tool or, or design and develop a communication tool with some expert that then the individual would be able to use when they will go to the GP independently. Mm -hmm. um, again, depend, I don't know, that sounds like quite a specific case. Um, so what I would suggest with that is, I mean, I, I would start with a conversation with the, your GP surgery and see they might have actual support um, within the GP surgery that they'd be able to offer you. And then if not, using your support from your GP or whoever else is involved in your support and care to see what would be best for your own specific local um, situation. Right, okay, thank you. And that's it in terms of questions on the chat function. We've got about three more minutes, so we're, we're absolutely on it in terms of time. Are there any last questions, the one last question, or shall I wrap up? Uh, Carol. Trying to unmute you, Carol. Um, Joe or Francis, can you unmute Carol? I'm not having much luck here. Okay, you're on, Carol, I think. Oh, I think. Um, Okay, well, well, not to worry. What, what, what I can do is we can contact Carol afterwards. Oh, I think she's back now. Carol, do you want to just quickly ask your question and then we'll close? I, I think she's not hearing. So what, what I think we'll do then is we'll reach out to Carol afterwards, find out what her question was, and we'll pass that all, across to you. Oh, here we are. Oh, I'm back. Oh, you're back. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the question, the yeah. question was, if somebody is, if somebody's mentally ill and they have to be taken into custody by the police, yeah. how do the police handle these people and what, what do the, what do the, what do the people who look after these mentally ill people do when they find out they're in custody? Do they come and help them, get them released, or do they stay in a cell? Okay, um, Bree, did you want to respond, or should we ask uh, forward Carol an answer afterwards? No, I can answer that quite quickly because again, I can only speak for City and Hackney here and here in City and Hackney, we have what's called a street triage team and that's where some a policeman and a 
clinical um, person from ELF will, will drive around together. So if they get a call for someone who is distressed or someone who is, you know, threatening to take their own life or is very unwell, they will go together. So when the police is doing their thing and the, the person from ELF is able to look at the um, the care record of that person, see if they have a clinical team that are already involved with them and link them into that very quickly. And they'll always be brought back to Hom into Homerton Hospital in that instance. We have a special um, wing for people. But again, that's what happens in City and Hackney. So that's how, how, how things are, are, are managed here. So I hope that helps answer, answer Carl's question. Thank that's you so lovely. much. Thank you. No Thank worries. you. Right, well, I think that's it now. We're just on four o'clock, so that's fantastic. We've got everyone's questions answered and bang on time. So thank you very much for that, Frida. It was really, really interesting. Um, absolutely fascinating and really look forward to, to hearing about the outcomes as the, as the project moves forward. So maybe again in a year's time we can invite you back and, and hear about where, where next on the journey. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Absolutely super. Thank you very much.